Welcome to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I am your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm speaking to you from New York City on this, the 13th day of February 2018. Before I talk more about today's show, let me remind you once again, I am the editor of Jay Taylor's Gold Energy and Tech Stocks. Uh, you can subscribe to that newsletter by going to miningstocks.com, miningstocks.com, or you can call our office in New York City during normal work hours at 718-457-1426. Would also like to encourage you to consider subscribing to Chen Lin's letter. Chen has uh, done an extremely good job over the years in uh, in making money in the market. A very smart individual uh, who uses his brains and a lot of hard work uh, to make money for himself and his subscribers. So it's ChenPicks.com. I do want to thank each of you for listening to the show, making it one of the more popular shows in the Voice America Business Channel, and uh, also encourage you to send along your criticisms, praises, whatever comments you have to questions for taylor at gmail.com. Questions at number four, taylor at gmail.com. We also want to thank our sponsors for making the show economically viable. Our sponsors for today's show are on Resources, Genesis Metals, Novo Resources, New Range Gold Corp., Dynacorp. Northern Empire Resources, and Uranium Energy. I've titled today's show, Why Dollar Hegemony May Be Nearing Its End. Michael Allen appears for the first time. Michael Oliver is here with me just in a few minutes from now. And William Engdell will return at the back end of today's show. David Stockman visits next week to tell us why the U.S. economy is in the process of self-destructing thanks to its indebtedness, in no small part because of the trillions upon trillions of dollars that are spent to force other countries around the world to US to use US dollars. Any nation that refuses to US dollar to use US dollars for trade is labeled a rogue nation. Now that's not something that the US says publicly, but if you stop to look around at nations that we learn are our enemies, they all have committed the same sin, and that is namely to try to get from out out from under the US dollar system, which uh, I don't blame them too much because in fact it is a fraudulent monetary system that was forced on us in the whole world, in fact, by Richard Nixon in 1971 when he caused the U.S. to default on its obligation to back the dollar with gold. Well, meantime, a massive global infrastructure is being constructed by countries that are gaining global dominance, not by military force, but by competing economically in the global markets. Of course, I'm talking primarily about China, which Secretary of State Kissinger referred to long ago as a sleeping giant. Well, the giant is now awake, and she is not only building a massive trade infrastructure over land and sea, but she is also accumulating massive amounts of gold, uh, And as are some of her trading partners, uh, Russia being uh, the most obvious one, but India is there as well as one of the BRICs. Uh, and that has, uh, of course, Russia has massive amounts of natural resources that China needs. Moreover, as the United States and the rest of the world is, in general, decay from a Keynesian indoctrinated society of overconsumption, and I would argue also a loss of its Judeo-Christian moral compass, uh, meantime, countries that the U.S. has labeled as our enemies are moving forward much more constructively, in my opinion, by producing things that the rest of the world needs. And this uh, economic power from the East is indeed starting to cause the existing world order to fray around the edges. For example, even a good friend like Australia recently noted that they are going to have to make some very difficult decisions regarding their future. Does Australia continue to provide military bases for the United States and lose its markets in China? Or does it do what is economically best for its own citizens? It's going to be very difficult for China to make some of those decisions, and they're saying so. All of these economies, uh, all of these uh, economic issues are related to growing geopolitical tensions with the existing order being challenged not only on sea and land, but also in the financial markets and as far as what the uh, global economy uses as money. Well, William Engdahl is scheduled, as I mentioned, to be with us in the second half of today's show. And he's going to talk about the new Silk Road and how the BRIC nations are, in fact, challenging the U.S. dollar hegemony. Uh, with its One Bridge, One Road initiative. And in just a moment, we will uh, talk to Michael Oliver to get his latest readings on the world's reserve currency, which has been increasingly weak over the past year or so. Could this be the end of dollar hegemony? If, if the dollar is in decline, it will most definitely have a profound bullish impact uh, on dollar-denominated price of gold and other raw materials. So one of the major focuses over the past number of decades has been on companies that, uh, at least one of my major focuses, has been on companies 
uh, in the business of discovering real honest-to-goodness money, namely gold, because gold has, over centuries, retained its purchasing power while every other fiat currency through history has reverted to its value, namely zero. With the uh, same fate eventually awaiting the dollar, in my view anyway, uh, but long before that happens, there are companies that are in the process of exploring and developing gold mining projects, and one that I visited last week is owned by a company I own shares of, namely Northern Empire Resources. Well, I'm very pleased to tell you that Michael Allen, the president of Northern Empire, will be with me right after our first commercial break. But right now, I'm really pleased to tell you that Michael Oliver is with me once again. Thanks for joining me today, Mike. Good to be back, Jay. Yeah, it's good to have you, as always, uh, Tell me, Michael, in the, in the second half of today's show, we're, we are exploring some of the geopolitical economic factors that may not bode well for the dollar over the long term. I know you look at markets first and foremost from a technical perspective, which keeps you subje- really keeps subjective views from causing you to lose money. Uh, and I know that you have turned bearish on the dollar, though, based on your technical analysis. Uh, but how is the dollar looking to you right now, Michael? Well, it's a, it's a major bear market. <laughs> That's our view. Uh, last May, the dollar had slipped from a high of 102, 103 dollar index, I'm speaking of, which is 57% comprised of the euro, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, it slipped from a peak of 102, 103, dropped to 99, and when it broke through 99 in May, we turned major bearish based on annual momentum. Uh, when you look at a price chart at that point in time, it didn't look like a, you know, anything important. It was just a minor slip. But from our work, it broke a 10-year uptrend line on an annual momentum chart, not on a price chart. It's since dropped as low as 88 and change recently. Right now, it's 89 and change. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there is some support around 86. Uh, and I think it's transitory, but I think it, it, it could hold up for a little while. Uh, but you know, consider that it was you know 103... Uh, Early 2017, dropped through 99. Now we're trading it. We could go down to the mid 80s, uh, all yeah. within less than a span of a year if you get there soon, which is a pretty mm-hmm. severe drop for a major currency. Uh, and at the same time, the euro has gone from you know 102 up to 125. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, and it's likely to go to 130 before it stops this particular rally. But uh, the, the, the first leg down in the dollar, I think, is might find support around 86 for a while. And it could generate some kind of counter trend rally, but that doesn't mean anything. It, it, it just means that you get a counter trend rally to a major downtrend. Usually, when annual momentum trend changes occur in the dollar, they last for several years, mm. not quarters. So we're still we're not even a year old on the downside. It began last May, so I think the dollar's a bear. Period. Uh, I know all during the, the process of the recent decline, there have been a few rallies. Late last year, there was a rally from just above 91 to up over 95. Everybody got all excited. That was the bottom. And then before you knew it, you're making new lows. Uh, and I think you just have to ignore the rallies uh, and you know come back in a few years, see where it is. I suspect it's going to be a lot lower. Reflective of that is gold. Gold is behaving well. Uh, gold did much of its upside without any need of help from the dollar. Because after all, gold turned in 2015 from a low. And by the time the dollar topped and started down, gold had already gained a lot of ground. So mm-hmm. it's not necessarily a one-to-one correlation there. You know, where you, it, it, gold needs a weak dollar to go up. That's, that's not the case. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of other interesting events are unfolding. We think the T-bonds are now uh, have begun a debacle. Uh, we thought that actually October a year ago, 2016, but they broke some stuff in January that uh, just looks horrendous. So did the German bunds, German debt market, uh, you know, which is highly manipulated by uh, Draghi and so forth. So we think all the stuff that the central banks have done for the last, uh, you know, six, seven years at least, but even beyond that, but especially the last six, seven years, you know, QEs with uh, zero interest rates, negative interest rates, uh, totally insane concepts, uh, but they persisted for a long time. And when you create an error, uh, the cost of money, you drive the cost of money to where it otherwise would not be, where mm-hmm. not the central banks, distortions occur. Investors make decisions, families make decisions, companies make decisions, long-term decisions, and they're based on, you know, one of the big assumptions is the cost of money. And if that cost of money is false, and the entire foundation of their investment decision is based on the expectations of the cost of money, then can you imagine what happens if the cost of money suddenly doubles? 
Right. Uh, you know, it's well, like kids. Well, it, I mean, and that's isn't that what's really causing the uh, the stock market to quake a bit now? Yes, I think it's. In fact, our opinion is you've seen the top. Now that doesn't say you're going down instantly. It doesn't say you're going to crash. It just says you've seen the top. Circle it. You're not going back there. Now, can you have strong rallies? Yes. Uh, in fact, this rally we're currently in wouldn't surprise me. The S and P maybe gets up closer to 2,700 before it rolls over. Uh, I don't think the recent low we made last week, which happened to be the 200-day average, which is, pardon me, it's an idiot number. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, if everybody uses it, it doesn't work, okay? Sure. It's, uh, like, uh, Joe Granville said, if it's obvious, it's obviously wrong. I suspect the low we're going to make in the near term over the next several weeks will be lower than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's not really the issue. The issue is, has the stock market top? We think so. Now, mm-hmm. the only debate about the stock market is the nature of the bear market that follows. You know, what, what, how, what do the legs of the decline look like? Right. And I think it's largely being led by the bond market, and that makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. And the bond market, I think, is about to get gut kicked because we think the grains, which have not participated in the commodity upside, are about to explode. Uh, we've been focused on the grains for probably several quarters and we put out a report yesterday. We've noted that corn is now uh, at the po- levels that it, it can't close a month out. If it closes a month out uh, around where it is now, it's a massive breakout upside. Yeah. It'll join soybeans. And we did trade it today up to a level it cannot close the month out at because if it does, mm-hmm. it breaks out on the annual wow. momentum. All right. Well, this is uh, we, we're really just about out of time here, Michael. But this is really going to be a, a very, very interesting year to say the least, oh, because yes. you know, as these food prices go up, the pressure is going to be on the Fed to fight inflation all of a sudden. And now you've got how this can they massive do that with amount the of debt. Week? Yeah, exactly. I mean, how are you <laughs> going to do that? Yeah. yeah, when the when the stock market is crashing or or, yeah. or declining at least significantly, so th- this is going to be a very very uh, a very very fascinating year, a tumultuous year, potentially dangerous year. So we're going to look to you for help, Michael, in guiding us through this thing. And again, it's OliverMSA.com, OliverMSA.com. The way you can uh, help yourself out the most probably is to uh, consider subscribing to Michael's newsletter. OliverMSA.com. Thanks so much for being with us again, Michael. Always a pleasure to have you. Always insightful. 